Church, listen to this scripture about the Lord's mercy, the blood that provides that mercy. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To be a Christian is not to be one who has no sin and has no need of mercy. To become a Christian is to confess our sin and our need of mercy and to find that all the mercy that we require and more than enough is provided in the blood of Jesus, which paid the price for our sin. Let's pray. Lord God, in the mercy that washes over us in the blood of Jesus, we gather to confess our sin, to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, which has taken away our sin, and now to address, to be addressed by your Holy Spirit in your word about overcoming that ongoing and remaining sin in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our text today is James 1, 13 through 15, and our title is simply Taking Sin Seriously. Question, when's the last time that you tuned into the news and heard from a doctor, Dr. Fauci or the Surgeon General of the United States or some epidemiologist on your favorite cable news channel, and they're telling us all sorts of things about this disease and how to be clean and how not to get it and how to know the signs that you've gotten it. Well, I'm a long way from being a medical doctor, and I'm not the guy that you want giving you medical advice. Uh, but did you know that an old title for a pastor is physician of the soul? I'm not sure I'm qualified for that title because I still have a lot to learn about souls and about how God deals with souls. But I have been a pastor for enough decades and I've interacted with enough people's souls, particularly about their relationship with their own sin and their relationship or lack thereof with the Savior, that I do know a couple of things about the human soul and about sin. So as we begin to address this topic of taking sin seriously, we'll read our text in James 1 in a, in a couple of minutes, but let me just open up with, uh, I don't know, two or three or four things that I have observed about sin as I've interacted with people as a physician of the soul. Number one, your sin makes you crazy. Your sin makes you crazy. It is a fact that sin makes you irrational, insane, and absolutely nuts. The Proverbs say, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Everyone outside can see the insanity of the velocity and the direction of the man's life, but to him, he can't see it. Ephesians 4, 17 and 19 says that sin darkens the understanding and alienates the mind from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. That hardness of heart leads to an ignorance of mind that ends in an insane way of life. Your sin makes you crazy. So I have, sadly, I have met with people who have taught the Bible and reasoned rightly with other people about how to overcome sin. And yet now that former Bible teacher is himself so caught up in sin that he is unable to see how the scripture confronts him and what he ought to do. Sin makes you so crazy that you become impervious to logic. You become utterly resistant to the lifeline that the Bible shows you. The insanity, the insanity is really this, that you begin to trust your own desires and what you want over the forever settled word of God. Listen, the word of God created the world. The word of God will unroll the world when this world's time is over. 
And when we get caught up in sin, we trust our own wantings more than we trust the eternal word of God. It's a fact that your sin makes you crazy, insane, and nuts. The second thing that I've noticed about sin is that your sin makes you hate people who call you to repent of your sin. Your sin makes you hate people who call you to repent of your sin. There's a story in 1 Kings 22. It would be hilarious if it wasn't so sad. This story in 1 Kings 22, the king of Israel needs some help, and he actually says, there is a man of God who could give me the answers that I need, but I hate him because he prophesies what he wants to say, not what I want him to say. Or he prophesies what God wants him to tell me rather than what I want to hear. Sin makes you hate the people that call you to repent. Doesn't the Proverbs say that a scoffer resists reproof? Proverbs 9, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Don't reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Doesn't the Gospel of John say in the third chapter that the light dawns, and yet men love darkness rather than light? They scurry like so many insects because they don't want the light to expose their evil deeds. Sin makes you hate people who call you to repent. A third truth that I've noticed about sin in my limited experience as a physician of the soul is that your sin always ends worse than you think it will. Your sin always ends worse than you think it will. Listen. Would you just listen to this, church? Sin will never disappoint in its ability to destroy. If you're looking for destruction, look to sin, and you'll find all the destruction that you need. Ten times out of ten, sin will exceed your expectation of demolition and explosion in your life and in the lives of others. Sin ruins. Sin kills Sin carries such awful consequences. The the ultimate wages of sin is death, the very wrath of God. Sin is bad for your body. Sin is bad for your soul. Sin is bad for your inner conscience. Sin is bad for your closest familial relationships. Sin is bad for your city and your nation and the world. Adrian Rogers used to say, sin fascinates and then assassinates. Sin thrills and then it kills. It will take you further than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and cost you more than you were willing to pay. Sin always ends worse than you think it will. As we're just introducing here with a, some observations about sin, I'm reminded, or I was reminded, I don't know, two or three weeks ago when I'm making these little videos that we put out on the church website every other day or so, and I made one about a, one of my favorite theology books when I was maybe, I was 19 or 20. I was pretty young, and uh, my pastor at the time challenged me to read this theology book called A Body of Divinity by Thomas Watson, and there are sentences in that book that are with me to this day. Um, Thomas Watson in that book, he has three or four pages on sin, and he begins with a question that is meant to haunt the human heart. The question he asks is this, who for one drop of pleasure would inherit an ocean of wrath? This is the equation that we buy when we sin. In another spot in that section on sin, Thomas Watson, this is significant for our day, he compares sin to bodily sickness, even getting a virus. He compares sin to sickness, and he says, there is more evil in sin than in bodily illness. There is more evil in the least sin than in the greatest bodily illness than can befall us. Because sickness can only harm the body, which will then be perfected in the resurrection. But sin can damage the soul forever. That is true. And church, I'm just... 
basically planning to get after you today because we spend more time worried about physical sickness than we do about sin. And this is not the will of God for us. Sin is so dangerous because it corrupts your character from within. Another sentence that I've always remembered from that book from Thomas Watson is, sin becomes to the soul like a moth to a garment. It eats up and devours the strongest threads so that the whole still seems to hang together, but it is so easily unraveled and torn apart. (sighs) Haven't you ever seen that happen in somebody's life? They had it together. They seemed fine. But because of inner sin and inner compromise, they became a person that was just shredded to pieces by life itself and by the the consequences and the events in their lives because that's what sin does. And finally, this word. I highlighted this as a young man when I first read that book, and it's I'm, I'm pretty sure a year hasn't gone by when I haven't revisited this little sentence. You and your sin must quarrel if you and God are to be friends. You and your sin must quarrel if you and God are to be friends. Imagine that. If I want a friendship with God, then I have to quarrel with me, myself, my urges, my desires, my comfortable way of living and compromising day after day. I have to firmly deal with myself if I want to walk with God. And you know that's true. God says the easy, broad way leads away from him, but the narrow way is his way. Taking sin seriously, taking sin seriously, taking self in hand and quarreling with your own desires is the way to joy and life and freedom. Letting your desires have their own way Letting your compromising, sinning heart just have free reign is the broad way that leads to destruction. And so I want to talk to you from James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, about taking sin seriously. Let's read our text. It says in verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, or that you could translate it by his own lust. And then desire or lust when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Take sin seriously. In order to take sin seriously, one of the things we need to do in understanding what this text in particular says is we need to distinguish between trials and temptations. To take sin seriously, we need to distinguish between trial and temptation. James chapter 1 is an exposition or an explanation about the tests of living faith. And it says in the first half of James 1 that trials and tribulations come from God and they're meant for the testing of our faith. Trials and tribulations are sent by God for the good purpose of maturing us and proving our faith. Here in verses 13 to 15, it says temptation has an evil aim. Therefore, temptation doesn't come from God. It comes from within our own lust, our own sinful flesh. The trick is that here in James chapter 1, even in the original language, it's the same exact word. The word for trials in uh, verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials. The word for trials in verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, is the same word as being tempted in verse 13, and when it says that God doesn't tempt people, but it it seems very clear from 2 through 12 that God sends the trials, but it's very clear in 13 that God doesn't send the temptations. 
is the same word, but in one way, in, in one context, it means a test that is sent for the good purpose of developing your faith. In verse 13, it means a temptation to evil, which is meant to destroy you. Temptations, verse 13, are sent by our own flesh, or I suppose other passages say that they're sent by Satan, and their their goal, so to speak, is to make us stumble and sin. But trials, verse 2, are sent by God in order to let steadfastness have its full effect that we'd have this perfect and complete and beautiful and variegated Christ-like character. In trials, God is aiming at your maturity. In temptations, Satan or the flesh is aiming at your misery. In temptations, your own desires are using short-term pleasure to bring you long-term death and suffering. But in trial, God himself is using this short-term pain for an eternal weight of glory where your soul magnifies God as you become like the Son of God in whom the Lord is well pleased. The author is different. The object is different. The object of temptation is a quick pleasure that leads to a great pain. The object of a trial is a pain that leads to a great peace and even rejoicing forevermore. Satan and the flesh tempts us with the object of our desire so that we will end up suffering. Trials lead us through suffering in order that they can lead us to something greater than we could have ever imagined, which is Christian maturity. To take sin seriously, we need to distinguish between trial and temptation. And closely related to that, we got to get down to this issue of blame and responsibility in verse 13. That is, to take sin seriously, we need to place blame accurately. To take sin seriously, we need to place responsibility accurately. Where the blame does not go, verse 13. Where the blame does go, verses 14 and 15. You see that? Where the blame does not go. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm blaming God. Can't say that. It's impossible, verse 13 says. Where does the blame go? Verse 14, but each one is tempted. The blame for that temptation is when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. So verse 13, the refusal of a divine source for temptation. Verse 14, the reality of a human source for temptation. This is what uh, it lays out here as far as understanding where blame can be placed accurately. You remember, you remember, don't you, the first story of temptation. And as soon as they sinned and had one opportunity to breathe breath into their lungs and speak about what they had done, the first thing that they do is attribute blame erroneously. Adam says, it was the woman that you gave me. The woman says, it was the serpent that you created. Verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted, it's God's fault. That's the first thing that we said. And every descendant of that first couple has continued to say the same thing. Even if you haven't said it out loud, you've said it in your excuse-making sort of ball of rubber bands that is your own conscience. Because every sinner sort of makes herself or himself an exception and says, well, I, I, I have valid reasons for what I did. We all do that. Even though it's a flimsy cardboard excuse that's so many fig leaves that, that ends up in nothing. To take sin seriously, we have to place blame accurately. Everyone takes a strategy of blame shifting when we fall to temptation. We all learned that from Adam and we learned our lesson well. Verse 13 and 15 are about, or verses 13 and 14 are about the conviction of personal responsibility. Don't miss this, church. The conviction of personal responsibility. Don't miss this. It's totally necessary for deep and lasting deliverance. That new song that Brennan taught us today, the the amazing joy 
of in our sorrowful, sinful state, crying out, Lord, have mercy. And the amazing joy of having the Lord say to us, if you confess your sin, I am faithful and just to forgive us, to forgive you, and the blood of Jesus cleanses you from your sin. That, that whole thing from the human standpoint hinges on this conviction of personal responsibility. We're saying, Lord, have mercy on us. We don't deserve mercy. Our sins are our own fault. Don't miss that. It's totally necessary for the joy of deep and lasting deliverance. This is essential for ongoing spiritual transformation. People who don't take personal responsibility never grow in personal maturity. I see it time and time and time again. If you want, if you want to end in peace and freedom and a relieved conscience, you have to begin in the burden of personal responsibility. It is so insidious. But I'm telling you, I see it time and time and time again. You dodge personal responsibility because you think, if I take responsibility for my sin, then I'll feel guilty, and I'll feel bad, and I'll feel anxious, and my life will be filled with the opposite of peace. You, you deny personal responsibility because you think that taking responsibility will make you bound up in this feeling of guilt and anxiety and shame. Listen, church, we simply have to come face to face with the fact that we have this whole thing upside down and we sabotage ourselves. We have to turn the whole thing around. The only way to peace and freedom and joy and a liberated conscience is a repentance that begins with personal responsibility. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. Listen, if you're in the process of stroking that temptation, and staying warm by, by being near to it. If you're in the process of entertaining and yielding to that temptation, to in any way, shape, or form blame God is the height of human arrogance and the audacity of human blasphemy. It's such a self-serving, ego-inverted claim. It's like the young man who murdered both of his parents and then threw himself on the mercy of the court because he said, oh, you know, oh, you see, Your Honor, I'm an orphan. How could I help but do this? We do, we do what we want with murderous intent, and then we try to get out of it after the fact. You will never, ever change and grow if you do that. The true source, the true source of temptation is labeled right there in verse 14. To take sin seriously, we have to label its true source. And it's there in verse 14. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. His own desire. The original language is emphatic using a double attribution of personal possession. God is not to be blamed. I am. The Edmund Hebert in his commentary says, temptation has its source, not in the outer lure, but in the inner lust. God is not to be blamed. The world is not to be blamed for the trouble that lies within. The trouble that lies within, the combustible material each person carries around within himself, that's where the blame lies. Now, we know from other scriptures, as well as the validation of our personal experience, that we are often tempted by others. Every parent has worried that my, my daughter or my son's friends will corrupt them and lead them away. Everybody has thought at one time or another, well, if, if my friend or if my sister had a better husband, then she'd be going in a better direction, but that, that close relationship is leading her in the wrong direction. That can be true. People can, people can push us towards sin. 
But the truth that this verse is proclaiming is that our own desires drive us to sin. And the stark truth of it is that if there were no other people pushing you towards sin, you would drive yourself towards sin with your desires. There is some truth to the fact that others tempt us, that there's real satanic opposition, but there's no truth to the fact that God tempts us. And there is full truth to the fact that our own desires mislead us and tempt us. ESV translation here that I'm reading in verse 14 translates it desire. The, the translation that I used to use translates it lust. It's the, the same word. We, I, I think ESV made this move because we, we tend to think lust is always a bad thing, but, but this word that's sometimes translated lust sometimes can be in, innocently, so to speak, translated desire. You know, the way to understand it is, of course, that everything, everything God created is good. Everything around us is, is right in its right use, in its obedient use. Whatever, whatever we're talking about, uh, human sexuality, um, wine and the fruit of the vine, whatever you're talking about, what, what, when God created it, it's good. And in its right use, not in its abuse, but in its right use, according to God's revealed will, according to God's righteous way, according to God's timing, according to God's loving limitations that he lays out in his law. But everything around us can be twisted by a lustful misuse by a disobedient use, by a lustful drive that causes us to transgress God's loving limitations placed upon us for our own good. When we use things not in God's way, but in our own way, when we use things not according to God's will, but according to our self-centered, recalcitrant, greedy will, that, that, that violates God's good design and is transgression and sin. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. It is a fact of Scripture. It's also a fact of human psychology. I, I, would, I would hazard a bet that the, the, the most uh, atheistic psychologist would actually agree with me about this. This is the fact. The human soul desires. That's the fact. The human soul desires. The human spirit is like a, like a sponge. It's always thirsty. We don't generate our own reality. We don't generate our own joy. We, we draw that in. And we're meant, of course, to draw that in from God. The human soul desires. One of the greatest theologians of all time, actually had the privilege to see him in concert more than once, is named Bruce Springsteen. And he said, everybody has got a hungry heart. He's right. The Bible affirms that. And the Bible insists that we meet those desires with God. We were created for that joy with God. And in in, in the most insane ways, we set aside God's law of love and we try to find joy and happiness in the things that God created and the things that God gave us, but we try to find it in ways that violate his law and we end up broken when we break the law of God. God is meant to meet the deepest needs of our heart. The gospel is meant to meet the deepest needs of our heart. Oh, church, I, I, hope in, I hope today, more than ever, you are sharing the gospel with the neighbors on your street. Everybody's afraid. Everybody knows life is not the way it's supposed to be right now. You know what life is, and the only answer is God and the gospel and Jesus. This is the time to share this with those around us who are groping and reaching. Take sin seriously. Church, to take sin seriously... We have to place blame accurately. 
We have, to, we have to locate here where its desire is in personal responsibility. Also, to take sin seriously, we have to assess self honestly. We have to assess self honestly. We already talked about it. I'm talking about the conviction of personal responsibility. I want to reiterate this because, church, it's a very important point, this conviction of personal responsibility. What is Christian maturity? You know, as a, as a spiritual leader of a, of, a, of a particular local congregation, on the short list of important questions that I want everyone to have the right answer to would be that question, what is spiritual maturity? What are we aiming for? Who is it, who is it around here that's getting it? And it's so easy to get that wrong. You see, we often end up thinking, get this, church, we often end up thinking Christian maturity is being able to say, I'm not tempted to sin. No. Christian maturity is the Christian who says, I know that I am combustible, and I know that I am easily tempted to sin. Therefore, I need Jesus. I need the Bible. Brother, sister, I need you. I need the church. I need accountability. That's Christian maturity. This is really important. And I think at any given time, about half of us get this wrong. We think that Christian maturity is indicated by the infrequency of temptation and therefore that we don't need accountability and a whole bunch of help. Christian maturity is not indicated by the infrequency of temptation. Part of Christian maturity is indicated by the infrequency of yielding to temptation, but it's not indicated by the infrequency of, temp of experiencing temptation. Christian maturity is indicated by the willingness to be honest about temptation and seek out help against fighting temptation and to experience an increasing, an, an increasing habit of refusing to yield to temptation. So I'm, I just don't know how to tell you, but to just tell you, through, through the many years that I have been pastor here, when a church, I want to say this honestly, when a church member has unexpectedly come to me and said, could I talk with you? Could you pray with me? Could you help me? I'm afraid that my marriage is in a bad spot. I'm pretty sure uh, that I have a gambling problem. Uh, would you keep me accountable? Because I know that I've looked at things on my phone that I shouldn't have looked at. Could I talk to you because... Um, I've, I've developed a habit of yelling at my kids, and, and, and it's not right. When someone comes and tells me something like that or a hundred other things that I could name, my estimation, are you hearing me? My estimation of their Christianity goes up, not down. <laughs> because real Christians are serious about their sin. Real Christians aren't Pharisees. Real Christians aren't phony you and your sin must quarrel if you and God are to be friends. Good churches, good churches like ours prize holiness and godliness. And, and so we need to be clear. We are striving for holiness. But we also need to be clear that we all understand this side of heaven. You hear me, church? This side of heaven, every single one of us is counted perfectly holy because our sin was washed away by the blood of Christ. And this side of heaven, every single one of us wages war with current unholiness because of residual remaining flesh and sin. And we need to be boldly honest about our confession that we are justified and holy, but we also need to be boldly honest about our confession of the ongoing war. Real Christians assess self honestly and then communicate that honest assessment with those to whom they are accountable. To take sin seriously, you've got to do that. To take sin seriously, you have to confess your need humbly and honestly. So to say, I don't need accountability because I'm a mature Christian is absolutely crazy talk. The most mature people know the most 
about their own combustible heart. I read that little Valley of Vision prayer book sometimes in the morning when I can't get my, I can't get the sleep out of my own prayer eyes. And the one that I read yesterday, the one I read yesterday, this is how the prayer begins. Oh God, if left, if left to the treachery of my own heart, oh God, I shall shame thy name. Only if you enlighten, guide, fill, and restrain me can I ever bring glory to your name. The more mature and godly I am, even as an elder of the church, the more I will pray that prayer. Not the less, the more. So RBC, your view of sin your understanding of yourself and blame and all these things we've been talking about reveals a lot about you. Reveals a lot about you. And your view of sin, your view of sin, this is as we transition to the gospel here, as your view of sin has that, has that leveling effect and that elevating effect with your view of the Savior. There's, there's like a double bounce where they both go up together. So what would I, what counsel would I give you to meditate on based upon this sermon and this text? Church, get this. Obtain and retain. That is get and guard. Obtain and retain a deep sense of sin as evil. A deep sense of sin as terribly offensive to God and a deep sense of sin as utterly ruinous to your own soul and the lives around you. Do what it takes to obtain and retain, to get and guard that sense of sin. And right along with it, church, if you've been tracking with me through the years, you know what's coming next. Church, obtain and retain a deep and high devotion to Christ as the savior of sinners. Do what it takes to get and do what it takes to guard that deep trust and that longing affection for Christ as the savior of sinners. So what can you do to get and guard a high view of sin? What influences do you need to mute? What entertainment do you need to stop being entertained by? What meditation and imagination do you need to cut off? And to obtain and retain a a closeness to Jesus as Savior. What people do you need to be with? What habits of of, of spiritual devotion do you need to develop? This is that gospel, you know, that double elevation. The deeper your sense of sin, the greater will be your gratitude for God's mercy. The stronger your understanding of sin, the stronger your ability to say worthy is the lamb who took my sin away. These always go together. So take sin seriously so that you can get seriously loud in your praise of the Savior who bled and died and rose again to save you from your sin. Church, one of the things, one of, one of my favorite things about you is that whatever feedback you've ever given me for my ministry of the word, uh, you've never asked me to keep it on the surface. You have always thanked me and, and asked me to get to the roots of what's really going on. And that's what James is doing in this passage. You'd think that if you treated sin like a little thing, like, oh, I'm, I, I do bad things every now and then, I'm just a lovable rascal, but everything's going to work out okay, that, that, that you'd end up happier. But it's having a heavy view of sin and all of its ugliness, and all of its deformity, all of its depravity against a holy God, and the way that it deforms human relationships. It's seeing sin in all of its putrid guilt that actually makes you a happy and beautiful and cleansed and God-glorifying person. The other way around will never make it. The most real repentance 
takes sin the most seriously. Unreal repentance skips over sin lightly. It's always indexed to our understanding of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And as we take sin seriously, this will elevate the, 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 the serious joy with which we praise Jesus for saving us from our sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, without your salvation, we could never pray. Without our mediator, we could never appear before you. And so we come before you in the name of Jesus, the very Son of God who shed his blood, that we might be clean, that we might enter the very presence of God. And God, I ask that, God, I beg you, cause us to want to obtain and retain a deep hatred for sin and cause us to want to get and to guard a a very precious and elevated view of Jesus Christ, our Savior. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen.